Did the British people vote for cross-party cooperation when they voted for a hung parliament? I think that's very difficult to argue. The truth is, at the end of the day, the reason we have a hung parliament, yes, it's because in the end only slightly more people voted Conservative than Labour, but it's also because the electoral system just didn't work in such a way as to give the Conservatives a majority. We shouldn't be surprised about that. The truth is, it's got a lot more difficult to win big majorities these days. Yep. Indeed, that's something somebody should have told the Prime Minister before she decided to go to the country on the 18th of April. The task she set herself in this election was always an ambitious one, and in the end, it fell flat. It absolutely did, and that leaves her in a difficult position. So the next question has to be, Jeremy Corbyn believes that we could be seeing a near-term election going back to the polls, asking the question again, maybe hoping for a different outcome. Um, a, what do you think the likelihood of an early general election would be, and what do you think the outcome would ultimately end up being? Well, number one, don't be surprised that Jeremy Corbyn wants an early general election. Yep. He's in his late 60s. Um, he needs an election in the next couple of years, probably to be able to realise his ambition of Prime Minister. And the truth is, he reckons he's on a roll. He transformed people's perceptions of him during the election. The Labour vote rose quite dramatically. And he reckons that in an early general election, he would win, and therefore he gets his chance to be Prime Minister. So don't expect the Labour Party to do anything other than try to bring this government down. Whether it will succeed, however, is another matter. The truth is that minority governments can often survive for quite a long time. We had a whole period of minority government in the 1970s, from 1976 through to March 1979. Now, eventually, that government lost a vote of confidence, but it did take two and a half years. Now, along the way, yes, expect this government to lose votes. The Great Repeal Bill, which is going to be published on Thursday, will provide lots of opportunities for arguments about the detail. We're already seeing an argument about whether or not we should or should not pull out of Euratom as a part of withdrawing from the European Union. And the government perhaps is going to have to concede on that, for example. Expect plenty of government defeats but remember, the government can stay in office unless it actually loses a vote of no confidence. Will it, when will it lose a vote of no confidence? Well, it may depend just, on... Just to be clear, this is, this is the government, not May. The, the, these are two uh, th different that's things. That's right. I don't, don't expect Theresa May to call another general election. I think it's a case of one, once bitten, twice shy. The question is, does the government involuntarily lose a vote of confidence yep. in the House of Commons? Now... That depends partly on by-elections and whether the Conservatives lose seats. It depends partly on whether or not the Conservative internal divisions over Brexit inside the Conservative Party cause one or two more MPs to defect. And it could also get down to such boring things as, does Davis Davis get stuck in the fog at Brussels airport on the day of a no-confidence vote? Um, uh, so the truth is, whether the government will fall early or whether it will fall only after some quite considerable time is very, very difficult to forecast because it literally could be down to, uh, down to circumstance, ill health, by-election losses, all of which are unpredictable. Yep. Professor, does the public, would the UK public uh, vote for Jeremy Corbyn because they now regret having approved the Brexit and think that he's a way out? Well, it's certainly true that the Labour Party vote is much more of a pro-Remain vote than is the Conservative vote. One of the things that happened during the general election is that Remain voters swung towards the Labour Party relatively strongly. Uh, Leave voters, in contrast, not least ex-UKIP voters, switched towards the Conservatives. So the Labour Party certainly has a pretty strong Remain electorate. But, of course, the problem the party faces is that, uh, on the other hand, many inside the party would like to get back the so-called traditional working-class vote, where Labour did make so much progress at this election, and that vote, of course, is much more pro-Leave. So the Labour Party is trying to keep together a coalition of what at the moment is a predominantly a relatively middle-class, pro-Remain vote, but also wanting to get back a more traditional working-class, more pro-Leave vote. There's an equivalent tension inside the Conservative Party, by the way, because on the, the Conservatives now have this predominantly pro-Leave vote, which is not necessarily the kind of vote that the big business, the Conservatives' traditional allies, would like the Conservatives to listen to. So don't be surprised that during the next uh, few weeks and months, both parties reveal internal divisions over Brexit, which does therefore mean at the end of the day, neither of them is going to give the electorate perhaps as clear a message as to where they stand on Brexit as voters might like, and therefore don't necessarily presume that Labour's position on Brexit is going to take it to victory in any early general election. Where do we stand on the, on the red lines? Um, the, the issue of the ECJ looks like it's being watered down. That was a big one for the Prime Minister. 
what about immigration? I, th these are the two areas in which we've seen the Prime Minister being most forceful. Do you think she's now going to be put in a position where she has to start to kind of water th those red lines? Well, down? I think we can distinguish between them. I think d trying to suggest we would not in any way be involved with the European Court of Justice was perhaps an unwise negotiating stance to take us. In the end, as it were, it's a, it's, it's a zero one issue. We're either in or we're out. Um, and I think the truth is that she's going to have to compromise that. On immigration, however, I think the crucial lesson of the EU referendum is that the levels of immigration that the UK has been experiencing over the last 10 or 15 years are, have been higher than the UK public are willing to tolerate. And there's many a Remain voter out there who would prefer immigration to be lower. So I think the reason why, at the end of the day, Getting out of freedom of movement is the bottom line of the UK government's position because that was the central concern of Leave voters. Now, there is then an argument about whether or not that necessarily requires us to be outside the single market and should the UK government yeah. have conceded that point uh, uh, straight away. The uh, Prime Minister may well be back under pressure on that, but don't expect the opposition to be pushing the government to saying we should remain inside the freedom of movement provisions. I don't think the one thing that's going to emerge out of this whole process is the current freedom of movement provisions are no longer going to apply to the UK. Pro Professor, I want to just get your take on how these Brexit negotiations go. In the now less than two years that they have, do you see any possibility of a Brexit and a trade deal being finished and, and ready to roll at the end of, of this negotiating period? Or do we have to go through some sort of transition period or even fall back on WTO rules? Um, well, I think point one is that the progress made so far in the last three months has been sufficiently slow that one must have doubts about the extent to how far we're going to get and whether we will get much further than having sorted out the size of the divorce bill and the crucial uh, conditions such as the position of EU and British citizens living outside their uh, original country. Um, and I think, therefore, almost undoubtedly, we are, we are going to need some, some transitional arrangement. I think on no... Well, if we, if we end up with no deal, we'll end up with no deal because, in the end, the negotiations fail to succeed. Either they fail to succeed because, in the end, we don't reach an agreement with the EU, or the government's uh, negotiations are rejected by the House of Commons, and that clearly must be regarded as a risk. On the other hand, I think there is now much less actual wish inside uh, the House of Commons for, uh, for us to reach a position where there isn't no deal. So no deal will happen by accident rather than by design, but clearly it's an accident that can't be ruled out because when two people get together and negotiate, there's never any guarantee that they will see negotiating. And given the government's position in the House of Commons, there isn't any absolute guarantee that whatever it comes back with will get the support of the House of Commons. <laughs> Is Brexit a big enough force to fragment the current political structure in the UK? There, is, there, is, there are things happening in the House that you wonder kind of where they end up. Well, the truth is, it, in one sense, it hasn't fragmented. We've got this remarkable situation where we've got, what, 85% yeah. of the vote in the election? Back to two parties. But it looks as though it goes back to two parties. However, the base, the, the kinds of people who are voting Conservative and Labour are very different from the post-war period. We've now in particular got this enormous age divide with around three-fifths of younger voters voting Labour, three-fifths of older voting voting Conservatives. That reflects a division in the referendum. And secondly, the really remarkable situation that around a half of university graduates voted Labour. The Labour Party, the traditional party of the working class, is now the party of the university graduate in the UK. Now, those are a very, very different uh, social base to the party support, and that does inevitably create tension. As already said, it creates a tension between the big business support for the Conservatives and the kind of more working class support that the Conservative Party picked up in the election. It creates a tension between those parts of the Labour Party that want to reconnect with the working yep. class and its current, frankly, so where middle does that, class. Okay, very briefly, where election. does that take us? That takes us to two parties that are currently very divided and within which there yep. are going to be internal arguments, the outcome of which none of us, frankly, can safely predict.